Hello and welcome to the Risen Jesus Podcast with Dr. Mike Lacona. Dr. Lacona is Associate Professor of Theology at Houston Baptist University, and he's a frequent speaker on campuses, churches, retreats, and has appeared on dozens of radio and television programs. Mike is the president of Risen Jesus, a nonprofit organization. My name is Kurt Jarris, your host. On this episode today, we're going to be talking about non-Christian sources, about the uh, resurrection of Jesus, or really the historical Jesus, and evaluating whether they are of value uh, for the project that Dr. Lacona has in his big, huge, thick book, The Resurrection of Jesus, A New Historiographical Approach, published in 2010. But if you don't own it, I want to encourage you to buy it. Also, before we jump into our discussion today, I want to encourage you to subscribe to Dr. Lacona's YouTube channel. Lots of great videos coming out from his channel there, and it's really a great way to get a notification uh, on YouTube that, hey, he's got a new video. Check it out. Uh, So we'd love to have you uh, following along on his platform there. Well, Mike, uh, going to non-Christian sources uh, pertaining to Jesus goes a little bit outside my comfortable zone here, um, but I'm, I'm keen to just ask you some questions and, and play a little bit of a, a reporter role. Uh, and uh, so why don't we just start with this? When we think about non-Christian sources, there, there can be value here about the historical Jesus because non-Christian sources, they're not going to have that bias uh, that may allegedly be for Christian sources. So that makes them a good source. Uh, but on the other hand, there are some weaknesses as well that I'm sure we'll, we'll jump into. Uh, so the, the biggest or most popular non-Christian source uh, that uh, is frequently cited and, and you devote a number of time to, uh, in, or rather space in your book, is Josephus. So tell us about who Josephus was and why he plays an important role for uh, Christian apologists in making a historical case for Jesus. Sure. Well, Josephus was Jew, a Jew. He was born in the year 37, so within four to seven years after Jesus' death. He was born in Jerusalem to a popular Jewish priest named Matthias. Um, so he's growing up shortly after Jesus has, uh, has been executed. And while the apostles, who are headquartered in Jerusalem and publicly proclaiming the message of Jesus and his teachings, Josephus is growing up during that time. If the book of Acts is correct, then um, it said that a number of Jewish priests were converting and becoming followers of Jesus. So this places Josephus in a situation geographically and chronologically uh, where he would have heard the apostles preach and know, know what the early Christians were saying. Also, Josephus was interested in spiritual things. Uh, He later became a a Jewish priest and a Pharisee. So, uh, you know, we can only imagine what the discussions were uh, around the uh, table of Josephus's family. But um, I think we would be right to anticipate that they would have talked about Jesus on occasion, um, even if in negative terms. Josephus does not become a Christian. Um, he fights against the Romans during the fall of Jerusalem. He gets defeated by the Romans and he ends up joining the Romans and becomes a court historian for the Emperor Vespasian. Now, um, Josephus mentions Jesus on two occasions. Both appear in his Antiquities of the Jews, the histories of the history of the Jews. Um, the one is a short passage, rarely disputed ever. Um, where it mentions the stoning of James, the brother of Jesus, who was called the Christ, the Messiah. So um, that, that's just a, a innocent kind of thing. Um, Josephus also mentions John the Baptist, but it's not in relation to Jesus. The other, t- uh, that text about James, the, the brother of Jesus, is in Antiquities, uh, book 20, section 200. But in Antiquities, book 18, section 63, I believe it is, Um, Josephus has a a text about Jesus here that goes a little more in depth about him. And uh, let me read you uh, this text. It says, At this time there appeared Jesus, a wise man, if indeed one should call him a man. For he was a doer of startling deeds, a teacher of people who received the truth with pleasure. And he gained a following among uh, both among many Jews and among many of Greek origin. He was the Messiah. And when Pilate, 
because of an accusation made by the leading men among us, condemned him to the cross, those who had loved him previously did not cease to do so. For he appeared to them on the third day, living again, just as the divine prophets had spoken of these and countless other wondrous things about him. And up until this very day, the tribe of Christians named after him has not died out. Now, that, that's the, the, the text of Josephus that we have today, but um, uh, unfortunately, the earliest manuscript we have is centuries later. And, uh, but we do have Eusebius with this text in the fourth century. The problem is Oregon says that Josephus was not a Christian, and Josephus makes in this text many statements he was the Messiah. He rose from the dead. And scripture said many wondrous things about him. Um, these aren't the kind of things that would be said by a non-believing Jew. So um, um, most Josephus scholars think that a Christian has sometime in the second or third century doctored up this text. It's probably true. They got in and they doctored it up, made it uh, sound better than it actually did. The question is, to what extent? What was in the original before that interpolator got involved in it? So a number of scholars have attempted to remove what they think the, um, was the additional stuff, the additional content, and get to what Josephus actually said. And I'm going to read to you um, a version that John Meyer, a historian of Jesus, uh, offers, and that Louis Feldman died a few years back, but he was the leading Josephus scholar of our generation. And he told me in an email that he agreed with Meyer's version. So you, 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 you tone it down, you dummy this thing down, and here's what you got. Um, um, and this isn't what all scholars who study Josephus agrees on, but he, Feldman told me, and he'd actually done some bean counting from like, I think 1937 to 1980. And then I asked him what he thought, and I, I emailed him either 2000 or 2001, and he thought the number of Josephus specialists who think that Josephus mentions Jesus here was at least three to one versus those who said Josephus didn't mention him. And he said he wouldn't be surprised if it was as high as five to one. So let me read to you this uh, revised text. At that time there appeared Jesus, a wise man, for he was a doer of startling deeds, a teacher of people who received the truth with pleasure. And he gained a following both among many Jews and among many of Greek origin. And when Pilate, because of an accusation made by the leading men among us, condemned him to the cross, those who had loved him previously did not cease to do so. And up until this very day, the tribe of Christians named after him has not died out. And I, I think that this would be plausible. In fact, you know, they don't think that he mentioned Jesus' resurrection. And I'm sure he didn't say the disciple, he appeared to Jesus' disciples. But I think there's a good chance that since Josephus is growing up in Jerusalem, where the apostolic proclamation is going to have a lot of focus on the resurrection of Jesus, Josephus almost certainly knew that this is what they were proclaiming. And I think a toned down version such as um, um, the disciples claimed or reported that he appeared alive to them three days later and the tribe of Christians remain to this day. Uh, that makes sense to me. I think that's a more plausible I think that's, that should be in there. But whether it is or not, we don't know. Um, we can only speculate. Um, and so Josephus certainly mentions the death of Jesus. And I think it is good for that. You have a non-Christian who mentions the death of Jesus and plausibly that his disciples re were reporting that he appeared alive to them. Hmm. Well, if anything, uh, it can uh, serve as a, an inspiration for... Um, uh, young people to want to pursue scholarship and to go manuscript hunting to see if mm -hmm. we can find and dig up uh, another manuscript which can help verify us which rendering is is the one we should go with. Uh, so that's something in my doctoral research I began to encounter, you know, um, for, for the fifth century monks I studied that was a uh, you know, there are different uh, questions about which rendering and the manuscripts and, and all that. And it's like, well, if only we found this, you know, that it, it could help us. <laughs> it's true. So now we've uh, got that situation. I, here. I don't know what it was for, you know, the literature that you uh, studied, but I know for the classical literature and post-classical literature, the, the stuff, the, the Greco-Roman, right? It's like, you know, by Cicero and Caesar and Tacitus and Suetonius. 
um, sometimes the best manuscripts, the only manuscripts we have would be 11th century. Mm. And most manuscripts for that Latin literature appear between the 9th and 15th centuries. So um, when we say Josephus, if he was 11th century, 9th century, whatever, or whatever it was, that's not unusual. Yeah, yeah. And to find an 8th century manuscript, you know, hey, that'd be a big improvement. So, and much more feasible than a 2nd or 3rd century manuscript, of course. Mm. Uh, all right, well, so Josephus is sort of the most popular of the non-Christian sources. Um, there are a number of other ones that we're going to run through here. Uh, but before we do that, what sort of value do you think you place on Josephus's two uh, references here to Jesus? Is there much value here? Well, for the first one, Book 20, Section 200, yeah, it tells us about Jesus was known as the Messiah by some. He was referred to as the Messiah and that he had a brother named James who had been martyred, who had been, or, or had been killed. And in fact, Josephus says that uh, he was charged with being a, a lawbreaker, breaker of the Jewish law, which is something we find in the book of Acts, they accuse the Christians of being. So it's certainly coherent with what we find in Acts and later church tradition from Clement of Alexandria and um, Hegesippus that, um, uh, that um, James, the brother of Jesus, had been martyred. So that doesn't help us in terms of our current project. It does with the historical Jesus to know that he had a brother who had been killed, executed, and then um, that Jesus was known as Messiah. But, uh, you know, for our thing about what happened to Jesus, uh, the book 20, section 200 doesn't help us, but certainly book 18, section 63 does. It informs us about Jesus' death by Pontius Pilate. Um, at the in, and he says at the instigation of the leading men among us, he's talking about the Jewish leaders. So that that's completely consistent with what we find in the Gospels. And if Josephus mentions the disciples reporting that he appeared alive to them three days later, that's pretty cool too. So I, I would say probable at least in terms at minimum in terms of Jesus' death uh, on the orders of Pontius Pilate uh, due to the instigation of the Jewish leadership. We get that from Josephus. Yeah. Oh, good. And it says that he performed deeds um, um, uh, that astonished crowds, you know, astonishing deeds. So uh, that would attest by Josephus that Jesus was known as a miracle worker. Yeah, yeah, that's great. And uh, we're going to get some other references to that as uh, well, um, although it may not be placed in uh, as nice of terms. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Um, so let's let's jump into a few others here. Tacitus is a historian who um, mentions Jesus. What what value is there out of Tacitus? Well, Tacitus uh, writes in the early second century, um, and uh, he's known by many, thought by many, to be Rome's greatest historian. He wrote the histories of Rome. He wrote the Annals of Rome. Um, in fact, what's interesting, the Annals of Rome, and uh, you've got books one through. Uh, six preserved in a single manuscript dated to the 11th century books um, seven through 10 have been lost and 11 through uh, either 15 or 16 I think it's 16 have likewise been preserved in only a single manuscript dated to the 11th century um, and yet much of what we know about Rome ancient Rome comes from Tacitus the, the histories too preserved in that la later uh, manuscript with uh, books 7 through, um, I'm sorry, 11 through 16. So, uh, but Tacitus, um, he just mentions Jesus in passing. It's really interesting what he what he says about it. It's in the context of Nero and and the, the relationship of Nero to the burning of Rome, which happened in, I think it was uh, 68, the year 68. So uh, the story that Tacitus tells is that Nero takes office as, as the emperor, and he wants to build a new a palace for himself. But the Senate says no, because the people are already taxed, and this would require even excessive taxation to fund it. Before you know it, shortly after that, uh, Rome catches on fire, and the current uh, palace of the emperor burns down with it. And um, there's a story that's going around that... He, uh, Nero was in a city uh, like 35 miles away. I forgot the name of the city, but he's in a, a city like 35 miles away and he's watching 
Rome burn and he's playing a musical instrument in glee as he watches the city go up in flames. And so people are turning against Nero at this point and he's getting a little worried. So Tacitus says, picks up at this point and he says, therefore to squelch the rumor, and this is in Annals book 15, section 4, 44. He says, therefore to squelch the rumor, Nero created scapegoats and subjected to the most refined tortures those whom the common people called Christians, a group hated for their abominable crimes. Their name comes from Christ, who during the reign of Tiberius Caesar had been executed by the procurator Pontius Pilate, suppressed by the moment, uh, for the moment, a deadly superstition broke out again, not only in Judea, the land which originated this evil, but also in the city of Rome. So here's something, there's a couple of things in there where he refers to Christianity as a deadly superstition, and he refers to it as an evil, and he refers to Christians saying they were hated for their abominable crimes. He doesn't say what they were, but elsewhere we find other writers, um, like in the martyrdom of Polycarp, the Christians were referred to as atheists because they denied the existence of all other gods. They were exclusivists when it came to Jesus. Jesus is God, and he's the only God. There are no other gods, not, not the emperor himself, no other god. So they were called atheists, and, and for that, many of them were executed. So you've got these negative terms toward Christians, which makes Tacitus a hostile source. But he mentions that the Christians derived their name from Christ, who had um, been executed by the most extreme penalty, which would have been crucifixion, by Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor, uh, during that time, during the reign of Tiberius Caesar, which is just what Luke tells us about Tiberius being the emperor. And um, uh, all four Gospels mention Pontius Pilate being the governor who had Jesus executed. And then it says that, you know, the, the superstition broke out again. It had been suppressed for the moment, which what, what, what does Acts tell us? They went into hiding and they didn't come out and preach publicly until Pentecost, 50 days after Passover. So it was suppressed for the moment. And then it broke out again in Judea where it started. Judea, Jerusalem's in Judea. And then it spread even to the city of Rome, the capital, the city of Rome. It seems like they're following the Great Commission, right? To make disciples of all nations, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and even to the uttermost part. So um, it confirms that Christianity got its name from Christ, that Christ was the leader of the moment, that he was executed by Pontius Pilate during the reign of Tiberius Caesar. And then it's consistent with resurrection. But of course, Tacitus wouldn't believe Jesus was raised. Sure, sure. All right, let's move along to Pliny, Pliny the Younger. Pliny the Younger. Him. Pliny the Younger was governor of Bithynia, which was one of the Roman provinces. Uh, he was a friend of Tacitus, and he we have a lot of the correspondence letters that he wrote to emperors. Um, and in one of those, um, he mentions, uh, you know, asking the emperor what he should do. Should, should, should he put these Christians to death? He had been going to their doors, having people go to the doors, the, the soldiers, and asking them to, to deny Christ. They had heard that they were Christians. Do you affirm Christ? If you do, you've got to deny him or you're going to be, you're, you're going to be killed. And if they refused to deny Christ at that point, he warned them again. And if they refused, then he, the, he would take them off to execute them. And, um, he talks about, he took two women deaconesses, I think, and tortured them until he got some information out of them. But these early Christians uh, seemed innocent. They, they um, sang, they got up early on the first day of the week, Sunday, and sang hymns to Christ as to a God, um, which shows that Jesus was highly revered. At, you know, we're talking about the beginning of the second century here. Um, so, uh, yeah. So, and they ate bread together. So that could be um, the Eucharist or it could have just been the meal that was shared by Christians afterward. Um, so yeah, we get some good stuff from him, but you know, it's not really useful when it, it doesn't say much about Jesus. It tells us about some early Christianity, but it doesn't mention anything about Jesus's death. Like he had been executed by the Romans, doesn't mention his resurrection or anything like that. So 
even though Pliny the Younger is is pretty um, is interesting and he provides us with some useful information, it's not useful for our present um, our present scenario. So I think Tacitus would be better. I said possible for Tacitus in the book, but I think it, uh, we should probably have him as probable. But for Pliny the Younger, I'd say it's just not useful. It doesn't give us any useful information. Yeah, yeah, and and the names we're going to go through, it's gonna we're going to find a similar situation here. Yeah. Uh, how about how about Suetonius? Suetonius is regarded as the greatest Roman biographer. He writes closer to how modern biographers write than any other uh, Greek or Roman of his day. Um, he's best known for his Lives of the Divine Caesars. He has he gives us biographies of twelve Caesars. Some really interesting stuff. I studied a bunch of uh, resources on written by scholars on Josephus. Uh, I'm sorry, Suetonius specialists, and uh, wrote an article uh, comparing uh, Suetonius's finest biography, his biography of Augustus, which was the second one in the Caesars. Uh, and compare that with the Gospel of Mark for its historical reliability. Kind of interesting stuff. That article is available on my website. Um, but but because he writes closer to how we write today, uh, it's pretty interesting. Now, it's disputed whether he mentions Jesus. Um, there is one uh, sentence that he has in his life of the Emperor Claudius in chapter 25, and it says, since the Jews constantly made disturbances at the instigation of Crestus, Claudius expelled them from Rome. Now, we know that Claudius expelled the Jews from Rome in the late 40s. So the question would be, why is he affiliating this with Crestus? Is, uh, in fact, it's Christus, which would be the Latin name for Christ, not Crestus. That's a different name. So is he referring to a Jew named Crestus? having a Roman name of Crestus, um, or is this a misspelling um, of Christ, Christus, and has he misplaced this? Are some of these Jews debating over Christ, who Tacitus thought was alive at that point? Um, we don't know. So it's very difficult to know, but, and, and scholars dispute it. So I, I'd say probably most think that he may be, Suetonius may be confused and referring to Christ there. Um, I just don't know. I, I, I don't know. But I don't think he's useful because in any sense, he's not much anything related to the death or the resurrection of Jesus. So it doesn't help us for the study. Sure. All right. Let's um, just briefly here go through the rest. Uh, Marabar Serapian. Marabar Serapian. We don't know exactly when it's dated, either late first century after the year 73. Um, it's either late first century or sometime later. We can't be more precise. Uh, Mar Bar Sarapian Mar was a Jew in prison um, who's awaiting execution, anticipating execution, and he mentions the death of Jesus. He says this, Or the Jews, by killing their wise king because their kingdom was taken away at that very time. So um, he mentions the death of Jesus and that the Jews were somehow responsible for this. Hmm. Um, and he's talking about their kingdom being taken away. Uh, and that would be referring probably to the temple's destruction. So it, it, it mentions the death of Jesus, but if it's, you know, shortly after 73, then it could be decent, but we don't know. So hmm. I don't think it's very useful. Yeah, yeah, too... Yeah, it's, it's vague. Yeah. How about Thallus? Thallus is interesting. Thallus wrote shortly after the year 50. He's writing a history of the Eastern Mediterranean world from the Trojan War up until around the year 50. Um, there are fragments of, of uh, Thallus that are preserved in the writing of Julius Africanus. We don't have Thallus's writings anymore. It's just fragments preserved by Africanus. And he's writing around the year 200. And um, Thallus mentions, and he... What uh, Africanus says that it, Thallus mentions an eclipse of the sun to a, uh, around the time of Jesus' crucifixion. And he said, no. And Africanus replies and says, well, it wasn't an eclipse of the sun. There was no eclipse at that point. Um, so it's hard. You know, Thallus mentions that darkness, but we don't have Thallus. We got it in Julius Africanus, who's writing 150 years later. But we don't even have the writings of Julius Africanus there. That is preserved in the writing of 
uh, Georgius and Celis, who's writing around the year 800. Hmm. Or, you know, it's someone who wrote yeah. 750 years after Thallus, who's quoting someone whose writings no longer stand, who wrote 150 years later, and there's no context. So we don't know if Thallus was, for all we know, he was responding to the Christian claim that there was a darkness at Jesus' crucifixion, and he's given a counter or an alternate explanation to that. We just don't know. So it's yeah. possible that he could be mentioning the darkness at Jesus' death, possible, but I'd say, you know, I, I'd say I, I'm not going to use him because it's just not enough. Yeah. All right. Finally, Celsus. Celsus? Um, well, you, Celsus wrote an attack on Christianity around the year 180. Um, we no longer have that, but it is preserved probably pretty much verbatim in Origen's rebuttal called Contra Celsum. And he's mm. writing that around the year 250. Um, Kelsen, Kelsus appears to have received his information from the Gospels, so he doesn't really give us anything new. Um, I'd say he's not useful. Yeah, yeah. All right, well, uh, thanks for that quick run-through uh, of non-Christian sources. There are some others as well, but time doesn't permit, and I think some people get the, get the gist now uh, that, unfortunately, there are some sources which just don't have much usefulness for the project uh, at hand. Well, I would say that Lucian, writing in the middle of the second century, he does, he, he wrote the book, How to Write History, but he writes some other things, and he's not the best historian himself. But in his passing of Peregrinus, he does mention um, that Jesus was a sophist, a wise man. He might have been saying that sarcastically, but he mm. also mentions that Jesus was crucified in Palestine. So that's kind of interesting, but we don't, you know, it's 165, 150 when he's writing this and we don't know where he got his information from. He's certainly not a primary source, so yeah. useful for Jesus' death in Palestine, crucifixion in Palestine, but it's limited value. Yep. Okay, uh, I'll give you a minute here, Mike, looking for a minute answer on a, a question from a listener. The resurrection, if true, ought to impact how we live our lives. Is it reasonable to require a higher standard of proof than for normal historical explanations? That's it's a good, good question. Um, so I'd, I'd look at it from two ways. Uh, number one, if you want to look at it purely as a historian, then I'd say, no, you, you shouldn't require more evidence for it. You need to look at the data and accept it. But then you're going to say, well, yeah, but is it going to be enough to convince me to become a Christian if I don't want to be a Christian? And that's a different, a different matter there. Mm. It's kind of like um, if uh, someone asks me to put, I don't know, a hundred dollars into a stock and I look at the stock, I do some research, some due diligence, and I say, oh, this looks like a good investment. I might, I might do it. But if they say, hey, I want you to dump all of your retirement savings into <laughs> this, well, now you're requiring more of me. Now, I, it's not that I need more evidence. It's either a good, good decision or it's, it's not, you know, it has, but I might require more evidence before I make that leap to put more in into it. Hmm. So, you know, before uh, devoting your life to something, you might want to, you know, look for more evidence. But I, I do think that the evidence we have is sufficient to establish that Jesus probably rose from the dead. Yeah. So even if it does require uh, a higher standard than, say, whether some war happened, um, Nevertheless, the evidence is there using right. historical methods um, that are reasonable, reasonable historical methods. It's um, the difference between, say, in court, where you look at the preponderance of the evidence for the civil case. Is it more probable than not versus a criminal case where the, it, you have to prove it beyond a reasonable doubt, kind of like that? I wouldn't say you have to do that with the resurrection of Jesus, but one requires a greater burden of proof. Yeah. Very good. Well, thanks for that short, quick answer and also for guiding us through non-Christian sources as well pertaining to uh, the historical Jesus and specifically uh, if we can gather much on his death and resurrection. If you'd like to learn more about the work and ministry of Dr. Mike Lacona, you can go to risenjesus.com where you can find authentic answers to genuine questions about the resurrection of Jesus and the historical reliability of the Gospels. It's there that you can find great free resources, ebooks, articles that Dr. Lacona has written, watches debates, all sorts of great material. If this podcast has been a blessing to you, 
Would you consider becoming one of our financial supporters? You can go to risenjesus.com slash donate to begin, to begin your support of this program today. Please be sure to subscribe to Dr. Lacona on Facebook and follow him on Twitter. Subscribe to the podcast here on uh, YouTube, the Google Play Store, iTunes, so you can get updates about when new episodes come out about this program. This has been the Risen Jesus Podcast, a ministry of Dr. Mike Lacona. Thank you.